The days went by. Mimal no longer existed, except on strategic maps. The front had shrunk, but a great many men had embarked. However, there were still thousands waiting their turn, shuttling between the positions they still had to hold and the semi-tombs where they slept their mutilated sleep. I still watched, through my dazed eyes, as these thousands wandered through the heights of tragedy, in a silence which, to my ears, drowned out all the noises of the earth. They had been stripped of their human condition, and I watched them in hideous loneliness, weeping internal tears as heavy as mercury. How long were we there? For how many lifetimes? It is no longer possible to say, and the world will never know. I feel now as though I was born to experience that test. Memel had become the summit of my life, the ultimate peak, with only the infinite beyond it. We felt that after Memel nothing of us would remain, and that the life we would experience in the future would be like the crutches one offers to a cripple. Memel is the tomb of my life, the absolute. The silence which enveloped our groups had a miraculous quality, which allowed each of the living dead we had become to think about what would follow our misery. However foolish it may seem today, the thought that our wretchedness would be recognised later, even posthumously, was a comfort. Today, even this last concern has disappeared. Anything which might be said about our misery depends on a system of interpretation which is believed to be perfect. But the spectacle of Mimal will not even be helped by the last judgment. It is growing dim and vanishing without ever having been seen. We had left our cellar for a pillbox whose gun had been destroyed. I had stuffed my belongings into the space formerly occupied by the gun. Following my example, Hals, Schlesser and another fellow had done the same. Wiener, Lindbergh, Furham and seven or eight others occupied what was left of the turret itself. Our new lodging was less humid than the cellar, but that was not the reason for our transfer. We had shifted because, in our new quarters, we were closer to the various points we might have to reach at maximum speed. Our defence perimeter had shrunk even further, because once again the Russians had become interested in us. The German troops, still holding the tiny Memel stronghold, had to face the possibility of serious attacks which might prove decisive. As it was, we were often obliged to approach our positions with extreme caution. Our men, driven beyond desperation, sometimes surrendered to the Russians, who would then put on their captives' rags and wait for the relief. Our wretched men had fallen into this trap several times. Even more often, in their exhaustion, they had failed to notice Ivan crawling toward them until it was too late. Then Ivan would replace them. Wiener and two other fellows had almost fallen into one of these traps. The veteran had spotted it in time, and had exploded into the kind of rage we knew so well. He saved us, stammered one of the men who'd been with him. He let them have all his grenades right in the face. Both men talked in gasps, in an automatic nervous spasm. In fact, they both knew they were probably done for. Wiener said nothing. He had recovered his silence and lay prostrate against the bunker wall, which glittered with frost, while we looked at him. We had grown used to being saved by Wiener. That evening, one of our men had tried to smoke a cigarette retrieved from a Russian cadaver. He had lit it and gone outside to relieve himself. Ivan had sharp eyes. He had spotted the glowing tip of the cigarette, and a 50 millimeter shell had pierced the concrete and burst in our comrade's back. He died without a sound. Ivan has come even closer, muttered Furham. The next day, in a piercing cold, we went to our outermost position, which should have been in Russian hands for some time past. 2. On our way, we passed the last tank remaining in that sector. It was an old M2, which had already been on fire and bore the impact marks of many shells. Its own guns had been destroyed and replaced by others that weren't made for it. Each day it moved to a trench cut through the ruins of an alley, and held Ivan back whenever he tried to get through there. The infantry in its neighbourhood had often rescued that old machine from contests that were too unequal, while the soldier gutter rats infesting the ruins nearby held it in respect for the inestimable services it still performed. Today, the tank's engine had broken down, and a team of ragged mechanics were labouring over it. We had huddled nearby to watch for a moment, 
One of the mechanics broke a tool and threw it on the ground in a rage. We heard the others talking. The machine was beyond repair. The men stood around, considering what to do with it. It had become a familiar part of our daily landscape. Two planes had just flown over the ruins closest to us. All the tank crew took shelter beside the tank and stared up at the planes with feverish intensity. To our surprise, we found ourselves looking at two German reconnaissance planes. Where had they come from? They banked when they saw the tank, which no longer bore any insignia. For a moment, we were all seized with a horrifying doubt. Would the planes take us for Russians? We all stepped into the open and waved, with our arms spread wide, and the moment passed. The two planes flew over us very low, to the right. We could see the pilots. One of them even waved. They must have come from a German base, from Germany, where everything was still possible, perhaps. Our grey faces followed their flight until they vanished. In imagination, we followed them for longer still. We were still faced with the problem of the tank. The passage of the two planes had given us a fresh stimulus. Everyone was standing around the machine. Someone suggested that we try to push it. Although it was a mad idea, we all took hold of the rough and icy metal. Shouting hoarsely, we tried to establish a rhythm. There were about thirty of us, hoping to synchronise our efforts. Our boots slipped and crunched against the icy ground, but the tank didn't move. Our emaciated bodies seemed to have lost their strength. The three crewmen swore at our impotence, but still the tank didn't move. After a hurried discussion, two of our men ran to the rear. We were about to follow them when we heard the sound of an engine. There was also a truck left in Memel, which I hadn't known until that moment. However, it arrived, jolting and backfiring. Before it had quite reached the tank, the men had pressed pieces of wood against its radiator to protect it from the shock. Then it nudged up to the tank, shoving it from the rear. For a moment we thought it was going to stall too. Then, with a series of shoves, we managed to start the tank rolling, lifting it from behind and letting it fall several times. I stared at one of the slowly turning rollers. Its motion struck me as the essence of the miracle of Mimel in miniature. The truck's engine roared and our boots crunched against the solid ground. The tank rolled forward and we continued on either side of it without losing our grip. My head was swimming from the effort, but I knew that something was happening in direct response to our will. Perhaps such knowledge is what constitutes joy. The heavy roller, studded with rivets, turned, and my eyes devoured it. It had also rolled across the infinity of the step, where part of my life had crumbled away, and it was turning now, just as I was still breathing. Joy is as simple as that. It would die, perhaps, within a short distance, as Hal's or I might die, but until death came it would roll noisily down the slope. I felt very much akin to this huge metal object. In Mimel, anything that moved was still alive. I was still alive. We returned twice more to the position. We would go again the next day, if we survived the night. However, that night Ivan was very much awake, raining death onto what was left of the town. The ground trembled continuously, and the sky was starred with flares. The light was as strong as broad daylight, reducing the luminous brilliance of the explosions. Our shelter cracked beneath the Russian blows, and as our lungs emptied of air, we sensed the presence of death. Volas, our leader, tried to kill himself, but we pursued him outside and grabbed him by the belt. During the course of this rescue operation, one of the rescuers was killed. Russian tanks had reached the hill to the south of our camp. Our soldiers, who had been in the path of their advance, had done their duty before they died. Then a heavy bombardment from the sea had struck the tanks as they slid over the dunes. Several tanks to the south of us went up in flames. The Russians were even forced to retreat a little, fighting as they went. The bombardment from the sea continued. Through the darkness and fog, we could see the luminous discharges of the guns. With daylight, we were able to see the source of our help through heavy curtains of smoke. Two warships were standing close by the shore. One of them was the Prince Eugène, the other was a ship of the same size. To the desperate defenders of Maymel, they were a source of support we had never hoped for. The tanks respected their large guns and kept their distance, 
In the morning, we were supposed to return to the position described above. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, I had managed to sleep fitfully, like everyone else. Our sleep, under these circumstances, had its own peculiarities. We slept while we were wide awake, with our eyes open like extinguished lamps. There was scarcely any difference between our faces and the faces of the dead. When I woke up, I wondered if I would still be able to move. My body felt like dead wood, and I no longer dared look at my arms, which were so emaciated they were like two sticks. I felt an intense pain in my chest, as if another battle as fierce as the one outside were raging through my interior. Nonetheless, I had to wrench myself from my torpor. Everyone else looked as strange as I did. I stared at them all once again as I stuffed my crumbling teeth with shreds of cotton torn from the hem of my coat. Their faces were as grey as the faces of the dead. One would have said they were dead, or else perhaps that nothing left in Memel was still alive, which seemed a distinct possibility. We left. The Russians were firing haphazardly now, as if they were just passing the time, a bullet to the left, another to the right. After the night's bombardment, none of it seemed serious. As we drew closer to the front line, the chaos became indescribable. We had to climb through or over holes and protuberances of more than six yards. My head was spinning. I no longer had the strength of a child. We could see the smoke hanging over the Russians' position as well. The Kriegsmarine must have scored several direct hits. On our way, we passed several fellows who were freezing behind their guns. They stared at us as if everything was our fault. We went on without a word. Manners, the weapon of the unmannerly, counted for nothing here. Everything was dead except courage, if that was still of any importance. We had nearly reached our hole, with another 150 yards to go. I could see the earth heaped around it, and the empty munitions boxes, and the hole, where we would freeze for hours on end, and perhaps even die. What difference did it make where we were? It was just as cold in our bunker. Anyway, to hell with it. I was still alive. But what was Weena doing? He had stopped. I couldn't understand it. But it was all the same to me. I was so tired. But why was he firing? Weena had set up his MG right on the ground, without even opening its front legs, and was sweeping the crest of our hole with short bursts of fire. Everyone else had instinctively found a hole. Hulls was right beside me, but I couldn't look at him. He had grown old too quickly. He might have been fifty years old. We'll soon find out, he muttered through clenched teeth. The veteran threw a grenade which landed near our former position. What an extraordinary man Weena was. If our own troops had been in the hole, they would have shouted. The pop-offs were quiet. If they had tried to fool us by shouting, we would have recognised that trick right away. But Weiner had obviously been right. They were firing at us now. That was their answer. Schweinhund! shouted Weiner. Bastards! Weiner should have been a general, or even the Führer. We had more confidence in him than in anyone else. He was firing straight at those damned muzhiks. No one dared move. And to make matters even more disturbing, we could hear the noise of tanks coming toward us from behind the ridge of banked-up earth. We knew that there were one or two Russian tanks back there, which were now going to direct their fire at us. Weena had undoubtedly made the same calculations. He was sliding carefully backward, dragging his gun. To my left, one of our men had just been hit. Let's go back! Hals shouted. But moving back was just as dangerous as moving forward. Who could I think of to give myself more courage? My mother? Did I even have a mother? Of Paula? But what good was my version of love in my universe? Of my own skin? My skin looked like Hals's, and I didn't have the courage to look at that any more. It's madness to have courage for nothing. There was Wiener, our leader. He was worth dying for. We had to abandon our friend Hans. His hip had been shattered, and under Russian fire we could do nothing for him. We said goodbye to him. He would know how to die, since he had known how to live at Mamel. We didn't worry about it. We reached a shell hole where we set up our two FMs ready to fire. As we had expected, the Russians were now plastering the area we had just left with fire from their tanks. The war machine was starting up again, both to the north and to the south. 
The Russians were coming down into our trench. It was terrible to see them, and we felt half dead with fright. Wiener wasn't firing. He looked at us, and we looked at him, as if praying for advice. Reflected on his face, we could see the immensity of the disaster. Get out! he shouted suddenly, his voice rising above the noise of the guns. Get out of here as quick as you can! We had already grabbed our things and plunged down into the bottom of the hole. We stopped for a moment and stared at Wiener. Come on, shouted Furham. Shut up, pastor. You get out too. But Furham had his duties, which kept him where he was. You go on for the love of God. Clear out and don't worry about me. I've had enough of fighting and retreating. Wiener, there'll be no room for me after the war, remember? The veteran had opened fire. He was firing like a madman at the Russians who were coming along the trench. Fairham called again, but the sound of the gun drowned out his voice. We ran back off that ground which was shifting and crumbling under our feet. The position was no longer tenable. Why didn't Wiener follow us? Ten minutes later, we plunged down into our mortar and anti-tank positions. Five hundred yards to the east, we could see a thick cloud of smoke rising from the position we had just left. As the deluge of war poured over us, and the parapet of the gun pit trembled like the railings of a ship caught in a storm, we clung to our guns with trembling hands, as to our last salvation. The fire from the ships made a critical difference to us. Without it, we would have been overrun. The danger was so pressing that no one could leave his post. Through the sharp noise of the guns, we could hear the wounded groaning. Such a peak of tragedy was beyond understanding. Each of us felt alone, stripped of all feeling and all judgment. Perhaps there would not even be time for a few hours of rest before our deaths. The men waiting at the piers had gone back to points of defence. This was not altruism, but simple self-interest. They knew that if Mimel fell, no one would leave. At a high pitch of fury, they drew on their last reserves of strength to keep watch and prevent Ivan from destroying their cavalry and their hope. Mimel still held. Mimel, a small island of courage drawn from an infinity of anguish. But the boats didn't come. Had we been abandoned? Had this final reason for fighting vanished too? Was this the end? However, the following night, a ship drew into shore like a ghost. A crowd of dying men ran towards her, fighting among each other for places. No order could have held them back. In any case, the officers were in the same state as their men. Here, no one fought because a whistle blew. We fought because there was no other possibility. It seemed that the ship had not come to pick up men, but food. We had enough food to hold out for another three months, but since we were to be withdrawn immediately, these supplies should have been destroyed. However, to the south, there were hundreds of thousands of refugees who were dying of hunger and cold. The crowd which had collected near the shore heard the voice of the naval officer shouting through an amplifier. At first, they couldn't understand these words, which seemed to be coming from another world, from a man whose floating mobility allowed him to see the worst from a distance. They vaguely grasped that from their misery, they could still help other people farther to the south. A single word ran through their minds in an endless refrain, immediately, immediately, immediately. The boat loaded up with our supplies and took on a few wounded, immediately. The crowd stood motionless, wrapped in a silence as large as the night. Our diminished group had been sent to the northern edge of the stronghold, to a beach beside the sea, overhung by moderately high cliffs. We still held the cliff tops in bunkers which had been built facing the sea. However, the Russians had also reached the cliff tops at several points, and even though they were not yet there in strength, they had sent out sharpshooters who controlled the rocky beach along which we were crawling under their fire. The German positions on these heights were fortified islands, surrounded by the enemy and living on God knows what. There was no longer any question of the Gross Deutschland division, or any other division. Everything which could still move in Maymel was alive, and anything alive had to be used. A ragged officer had brought us to this point, where he feared the Russians might break through our rear lines. Although the position was very dangerous, it was at least somewhat less dangerous than the official front.
Tanks couldn't get through unless they reached the heights, which we still dominated and weakly defended. For shelter, we used the holes dug by civilian refugees who had waited here for deliverance by sea. We were in almost constant contact with the Russians. Ivan moved along the length of the coast, peppering us from the cliffs. Sometimes he used mortars. The sandy soil was as churned up as if a harrow had been through it, and we were constantly digging out both the living and the dead. However, in this soft soil, the impact of missiles was usually dissipated. The Russians were just playing with us, but they gave us no respite. If our heads hadn't been empty, they would have burst with exasperation. Although the cold was cruel, nature had also sent us fog, which was an ally. The Russians had infiltrated our lines and were sometimes even killed from behind. They were afraid too and were hoping that support from their artillery and tanks would crush once and for all this cemetery where even the dead seemed to defy them. They infiltrated with great caution and when they thought we could hear them, they shouted insults at us, telling us what they would do to our wives and mothers. They also said they were planning to remove parts of ourselves. Sometimes, too, they sang. Hals and I listened, with our fingers on our triggers, because they often sang and shouted like that to distract us. I mai drugi germanski, kak sabachi cholet, ya tibai skadju spasiba uyudna mamenchka. Then they would count. Listen, German soldiers, you are going to die. Listen, raz, dva, try. Then they would let off a volley while we listened in silence like antennae destined to pick up all the ignominies on earth. During the night, two more boats came. At the risk of instant death, a crowd of ragged soldiers ran to board them. We were too far from the shore to get there in time. As the nausea rose in our throats, we stood powerless, trying to calculate our isolation. Every time a boatload withdrew, our defence was weakened to that degree. Nothing could stop Ivan now. As soon as the wave broke, we would run like rats. The long nightmare turned heavily in our minds, and we all trembled uncontrollably. Howells had lifted his gun to his head. I must have stared at him with enough sorrow to stop him. He turned back onto his stomach and crushed his face into the ground. The next day, we were still covered with fog. The front was quiet. Were the Russians preparing something? Hulls and Schlesser had crawled toward the water, toward a smashed car which stood in the spray at the edge of the beach. I joined them, taking maximum precautions. Hulls spoke in a half-whisper. You help us, Sager. We'll get those inner tubes. Three of them are still good. To make floats? Yes, a raft. But be careful. We don't have any tools, so we'll have to use bayonets. Do it like this. But be careful. I felt as if a shaft of light had pierced my mind. A raft. We might float for a long time, but this also might be our last chance. We had no tools, and we would have to get the tyres off the wheels without lifting them. Trembling with anxiety, we set about this desperate task. The inner tubes had to be full of air, otherwise they'd be no good to us. Faham came over and joined us. You're crazy, he said. Even if you get the tubes out, they're sure to burst. After all, it's the tyre that holds the pressure in. It was true that we'd been half off our heads for quite a while now. We couldn't give up the idea of escape and received Ferrum's objectivity with ferocious scowls. Then let's take the whole wheel, Hull said. I'm sure they won't float, said Ferrum. Shut up, roared Halls. You stick to your god. Myself, I have more confidence in these tyres. Ferrum said nothing more and like the rest of us, tried to free the nuts with the tip of his bayonet. It took us at least two hours to complete the job. We also had to dig away the sand from under the right front tyre, as the wreck was lying on its side. We could hear the sound of heavy mortars in Maymel. The ground shook as far out as we were, and it seemed likely that the Russians had taken a big slice of what was left of the town. We no longer dared to think about what might be happening there concentrating instead on the ridiculous work we had undertaken. Twice we were forced to give it up and get back to our holes. The Russians were infiltrating all along our positions, crawling through the fog almost everywhere. Hals and I clung to each other in our refuge. 
For the seventh or eighth time, we had fired almost point-blank on Asiatic-looking men with Asiatic faces. Each time our Volkssturm shook in our hands, and we trembled with fright. By evening, the whole city looked like a volcano. Stalin's organs were howling without stopping, loosing a storm of random fire. Our shattered nerves no longer reacted. Everything was at once hazy and luminous. By now, there were seven or eight of us fastening belts and boards onto the three tyres, which would probably never float. Seven or eight who would probably be killing each other within minutes, for it was clear that the raft would never hold all of us. It was ready. Schlesser and Ferrum pushed it toward the water. We followed, like wolves afraid of missing part of the feast. Wait a minute, I'll give it a try, said Ferrum. We all took a step forward. Ferham looked at us. He knew that if he went too far, we would kill him. Our silhouettes wavered against the lights which were consuming Memel, and our eyes followed the movement of the raft as it pitched, half submerged on the dark water which melted into the night and fog. As Ferham tried to maintain a balance which every physical law made impossible, he must have prayed to the sadistic god who watched him sink. He didn't jump until the water had risen over his belt, as our safety foundered before our eyes. The night passed slowly, lit by the huge fires. The beach, from which we stared with enormous eyes, shifted from pink to orange. A very young boy from one of the Volkssturm groups had succumbed to despair. His body remained wedged upright in the midst of our group, most of whom didn't even notice that he had died. Another suddenly stood up and walked off, as if hypnotised by the flames in the south, moving toward Memel in a state which was certainly not conscious. We watched him disappear into the brilliant, unreal half-darkness. The Russians could have taken us by surprise now, without any attempt on our part to intercept them. The horrified faces of the last soldiers in the armies of the east were fixed with fascination on the apocalypse of Memel. At daybreak, the fire over the ruins of the town had turned pale yellow almost white. We were given no orders or coordinates and remained where we were, motionless and almost senseless, lost in the hideous solitude. Toward the middle of the day, Vollers, our leader, said that he was leaving for Memel. He didn't order us to follow him, but we did. Halfway there, we collapsed on the road. Our strength was gone, and the half-mile we had been able to stumble was all we could manage. Somewhere, a short distance to the east, they were still fighting. How was it possible that any of our men still survived? A heavy black cloud with a red base lay motionless across the whole horizon, and to the south, at the docks, there were other fires. Could anyone still be alive in that place? We lay where we were, prostrate and silent, with our eyes fixed on the enormity of the catastrophe. Hours passed. Our lives were running out and our eyes had a strange fixity. No one thought of opening the few cans we had left. We knew that any food would taste too bitter with the taste of Memel. Once again, darkness covered us, and our motionless group melted into the fog which lay like a winding sheet over Memel and stagnated on the sea. Another group of bent men walked slowly by some ten yards from us. They seemed somehow unreal, were they German survivors still wandering through this little piece of the void which fate still allowed us? Were they Russians? Or were they perhaps a dream? I don't know how long we stayed there. Perhaps for another day and night? No one can be exact about a nightmare. Also, it is a question of no great importance. Some things, like Memel, cannot be measured by any ordinary scale. I still need corroboration to believe that Memel really happened and is not the fantasy of a spell of madness. Describing it as I have done still makes me tremble with horror and suffer again, for even the memory is painful. The tomb of Memel, where no one has ever gone to meditate, will receive my recollections as a humble and discreet offering. I make no appeals to humanity and cry for no vengeance. Except for these lines, I remain silent because I have lost my power of discretion. I have also learned in my solitude that there is no power more unalterable than the power of forgiveness. At some point we became aware of sounds from the sea. Every sound from the sea could still mean life. We stood up and listened, 
The noise, which was scarcely audible, was muffled and heavy, like an idling engine. And then there was the sound of voices, at first blurred and incomprehensible. We walked out into the water, scarcely aware of its touch. Through two bursts of thunder we caught some words. Higher Windau! Higher Windau! They were asking about Windau, a city farther to the north. A boat with all its lights out was lost in the fog. The voice kept on calling. It was probably coming through a megaphone. We trembled and shouted as loud as we could, with what was left of our strength. Windau! We had all run into the water like madmen. The first shock revived us for a moment. We went on shouting as the water reached our chests. Some men stumbled and fell, and then staggered to their feet again, still shouting. Soon the water was up to our chins. We thought we would pull off our clothes and swim. Then the vague outline of the boat emerged from the fog, and we shouted again. The boat scraped against the sand and stopped. Half drowned, we went out to meet our salvation. Swimming, floating, sinking and surfacing again, we reached the sides of the boat. We could just make out the men leaning over the side, sailors, who were throwing us lines and nets. They were asking us questions, but no one answered. We were all hanging on to anything that was thrown out to us, gasping and imploring. I thrust my fingers into a hole whose edge was encrusted with rivets. My fingers, half dead with cold, gripped like claws. Everyone was shoving and pushing for a rope or net. The icy cold of the water began to break my will. Stiff with suffering, I kept my hold and fought against losing consciousness. An empty cigarette package floated from my pocket and lay on the water some inches from me. I stared at it to fix my wandering attention, and as I stared my vision grew hazy. Everything had become painless, and I scarcely felt the arms which were pulling me on board. They put me down on the deck, beside my exhausted companions. We were nothing but a shapeless, soaking mass, like a huge mound of wet sacking. Through my semi-consciousness I realised they were passing around cups of boiling hot tea, which I swallowed down to the peril of my inner organs. My motionless gaze remained fixed on the flaming Prussian coast. I no longer have any clear memory of what happened next. I don't really understand why we didn't die of exposure on the deck. Perhaps the sailors rubbed us to keep us warm. I can only remember one thing clearly. The roar of the war coming from the land dominated all the sounds of the boat and of the sea. Later, the boat arrived at Pilau, where we got off. On trembling legs, surrounded by a flood of refugees, we reached a first aid station where our physical condition was checked. A multitude of wounded men were sitting or lying all around us in huge open sheds. The little port seemed filled with a sense of feverish agitation and urgency. If the war had not yet arrived, it was nonetheless very close. We sensed its imminence and could hear its thunder to the northeast. We stayed at Pilau for about three weeks. We had been declared unfit for service at the front, as we were all more or less wounded, and otherwise in a state which deserved treatment in a sanitarium. Our liquefied brains were no longer able to grasp what was happening to us, or what was asked of us. However, although we were not in a condition to function under fire, this did not mean that we were exempted from service. The staggering flood of refugees which had poured into Pilau did not allow anyone who still had two arms and two legs to remain idle. Along with others whose wounds were more serious than ours, we were absorbed by the first aid organisation which was trying to help the civilians waiting to leave, in the face of almost insuperable difficulties. All of these people had lived through a hideous exodus, and the horror of what they had seen was still impressed on their emaciated faces. There was also a swarm of wounded men, soldiers from Königsberg and Kranz, lying about wherever they could. This was often outdoors, in the intense January cold, which sometimes cut short their sufferings. Boats were still putting into Pilau and leaving filled with people. Three quarters of each load was civilian, the rest wounded soldiers. This groaning crowd of men, clinging to a last hope of evacuation, was divided into two categories. The most severely wounded, those whose chances of survival were doubtful, who would at best be hideously mutilated, were not embarked. For them, everything was over. The rest, who might still have some hope of a decent life, 
were eligible for the boats, which, with any luck, would carry them to the west, to that region we still imagined as a zone of relative quiet. For every thousand persons embarked, some three thousand more arrived from the east, swelling the ranks of the mob which had turned to us for help. If the fighting should reach us here, it would be the hell of Maymel all over again, only worse. There were many more people here, and the numbers were continuously growing. People were coming in from the south, having crossed the Frisch's half on anything that would float. They came from Heiligensbeil, Pomerendorf, Elbing, and even from Preussisch Holland. They had been told that at Pilau they might be able to get on a boat. We spoke to several of these wretched people. Almost everyone had lost one or two relatives on the way, and described in trembling voices scenes like the ones we had witnessed at Maymel. We learned from them that the flight toward Danzig had been cut in two, and that the Russians had reached the half at several points. It sounded as if the horror of Maymel was duplicated in almost every Prussian coastal town. Swaying on our unsteady legs, we stared at the vast flood of human misery slowly washing toward the safety which had been promised. In spite of the most prodigious efforts, it was clear that these people could not receive even a tenth of what they were expecting. If their prayers had been heard, heaven would have opened to succour their misery. But nothing happened, and misery subsided only for moments at a time, as on the tear-streaked face of a child who has collapsed into a passing sleep. As winter closed in, the thermometer sank toward five degrees below zero, only aggravating the plight of the refugees and accelerating the death rate. A crowd stretched as far as the eye could see, in front of a large building crammed with people. From the building, a faint smell of the gruel cooking in large cauldrons washed over the tightly compressed mass of people who stood stamping their feet to keep from freezing. The thudding of their feet against the pavement sounded like a dull roll of muffled drums. The children were the most heart-wringing. Many were lost. When they tired of calling for their mothers, they collapsed into floods of tears which nothing and no one could console. These were the smallest ones, too young to grasp any explanations. Their faces, dabbed with tears which instantly froze, remain one of the most pathetic images of that time. We tried to gather them inside, near the cauldrons, where they might feel some of the heat. We questioned them, hoping for some identifying information we could broadcast over loudspeakers, but they could only reply with tears and sobs. Further on, a large metal cross, which stood on a slight elevation, glittered with frost. It looked like a huge sword, thrust into the breast of catastrophe. Another part of the crowd had collected here to listen to the prayers and encouragement of a priest. The cold grew so intense that the Frisch's half froze, creating new difficulties for the boats still coming into Pilau. The Frisch's half froze, and despite the desperate consequences of such cold, the fact was put to use. Hundreds of thousands, on forced marches across the ice, were able to reach the narrow strip of land at Neyrung and Karlberg, and finally Danzig. People also left from the pocket at Heiligenbeil. They experienced every sort of hardship, including attacks from Soviet fighter bombers, which tried to break the ice with strings of bombs and often succeeded. Private cars and other vehicles frequently disappeared into crevasses covered by thin films of ice. However, nothing could hold back the flood of refugees, who were prepared to endure the most severe hardships. As the Russians grew increasingly active throughout the sector, large numbers of people left Pilau by this providential route. Russian planes were flying over Pilau every day, and it appeared that the defence of Königsberg had given way. As the work at Pilau had become less intense, we planned to evacuate everyone who wasn't strictly essential. It was barely 12 miles from Königsberg to Pilau. The front at Kranz had also been shortened, and before long we too would probably be directly involved in the fighting. We were part of an inadequate reserve composed principally of fragments of broken or annihilated units, from which a certain standard of performance was still expected. No one knew any longer where the rest of the Gross Deutschland might be, but we still wore our divisional flashes on our worn and discoloured tunics. There were still a few familiar names near me, principally Lieutenant Wohlers, with a dirty dressing on his right hand, which had lost two fingers. 
Fairham, our disillusioned pastor, Schlesser, Lindbergh, who had survived his fear, and our cook, Gransk, who had long ago exchanged his cauldrons for an FM. There were also my friend Hals, whom I will never forget, and I, who have consecrated the rest of my life to bearing witness. Then there were seven or eight others whose names I never knew, who, with us, made up what was left of the gross Deutschland division in that area. Had our division been scratched off the list? Not yet, it seemed. An officer hailed us and ordered us to attention. Our eyes, which had already seen so much, studied this grey-faced Hauptmann, who still clung to his sense of disciplinary strength. This discipline, which had so often annoyed us in the past, touched us now like a soothing balm. Its demands were those made of living beings, of creatures still worthy of life. We analysed no further than that. For us, accustomed as we were to thinking only of the moment, this realisation was a kind of dividend. The captain spoke to us, and through his firm, official voice, we caught the intense emotion of the crushing load which weighed on all of us. Officers, troops, men, women and children. The time of boasting and gratuitous bullying was so far behind us that no attitude incompatible with the gravity of the circumstances was possible. A man was speaking to us as men. No one could evade the situation. However, this man still wore the vestiges of a military uniform and was still trying to impose some semblance of order in a cataclysm that had swept an entire nation into a devastating retreat. This man, who knew that everything was lost, was still trying to save the moment. He told us that we would have to withdraw, that we too would have to cross the ice of the Frisch's Huff and get to Danzig, where several sizeable fragments of our division still remained. He tried to tell us, in a tone that was not peremptory, that there was still work for us to do as part of a particular organisation which could be found where he had indicated. He was not trying to spare us a worse disaster when he gave us those orders. The worst was everywhere, and there was no escape. The Hauptmann was already walking toward another group of men, saluting as he withdrew. So we started to walk. A violent wind swept the snow from the mirror-like expanse of ice. In the distance we could hear the gentle purr of the sea, behind us the steady roar of war. In the evening we reached the Frisch Neyrung and the first anti-aircraft bunkers, which barely rose above the long grasses, bent over beneath their burden of snow. To crown my personal difficulties, I fell and injured my foot. It was forty miles across the Neyrung. I would have to make it anyway. For a long time now, I had known that fate was against me. I found a broken broomstick to use as a crutch. So many people had suffered and died in this place that my minor discomfort seemed almost indecently trivial. We progressed very slowly. The hollow of a battered, overturned boat sheltered us for a few hours. We were not the only ones to use it. A group of shivering civilians were already inside, groaning as they tried to sleep. I buried my head against Hals's shoulder, hoping to pass out, despite our wretchedness. We reached Karlberg toward the middle of the next day. The small town was overflowing with starving refugees. People with the faces of madmen were wolfing down the flour that was the only food distributed to them. Cans of condensed milk were reserved for the children. Soldiers also had to stand in interminable lines to receive, finally, two handfuls of flour apiece and a cup of hot water infused with a minute portion of tea. Our exhausting march resumed amid the pitiable swarms of faltering refugees. Twice we were attacked by Soviet planes, swooping low and scattering missiles designed to destroy tanks. Each impact tore long bloody furrows in the dense mass, and for a moment the wind was tinged with the warm smell of disemboweled bodies. Above all, I feared for the children, who could no longer understand anything about their situation. They didn't know that the planes were enemy aircraft, or how urgently they were faced with cold and hunger. Everything was misery for them, and each step was a trap. The sky could make them suffer, and the earth hurt them. Their hands and feet made them bite their lips with pain. They were lost in a state of constant fear, which was justified by a world of horror that never let them forget their pitiable weakness. They stared about them with unseeing eyes, at their swollen hands, which they wished were no longer attached to their bodies,
at the people around them who should no longer exist, and at the frozen grasses trembling in the wind, which they would never again enjoy as part of an innocent game. I feared for these children, who were being punished before they had committed any crime, for whom the idea of existence would become synonymous with vengeance. I could do nothing but watch this tragic procession. Even my life would be no help to them. I was not a redeeming Christ, and in any case I had discovered very good reasons for dying. We reached Danzig three days after crossing the ice of the Frisch's half. Everything was calm in the city, despite the tragic spectacle of hundreds of thousands of refugees. The war was to the south of us, so that we even escaped its noise, although frequent air raids struck at the heart of the crowded city. Danzig had become the terminal point of the Prussian exodus, and although huge crowds were living day and night without shelter, there was nonetheless a substantial and organised effort to help them. It was still possible to leave for the west by rail, and the port was still open to maritime traffic. We waited down by the docks, in a dense mass of vagabonds. Vollers went to a centre that should have been able to give us some information about reintegrating with our group. He waited for several hours under its flattened glass roof. I myself was in no hurry to move on, as the stiff folds of my boot pressed painfully against my swollen ankle. A large ship had come into Neufarwasser, and the crowd had flowed toward the pier. The ship had not yet cast off its mooring lines, and everyone would have to wait for several hours before they were loosed again. But in Danzig, then, time counted for nothing. Each aim was stubbornly pursued, even at the cost of maximum patience, endurance and suffering. As always, there were children, with their small faces twisted by emotion, staring and hating without comprehension and without looking for any explanations. When sleep overwhelmed them, they slept where they were, without any release from trouble. I, immobilised by exhaustion and by my sense of solitude, tried to see no more than the seagulls did as they flew overhead, seemingly part of another world. For two days now, we had been waiting for some information or instructions under the shattered glass structure of the station. A wind that made the inside as cold as the outdoors shook the metal frame, loosening and scattering the remaining glass fragments. We had to keep walking and waving our arms to avoid freezing on the spot. As it was very hard for me to walk, my comrades gave me a permanent place inside, while they took turns walking through the rubble of the port. Finally, a piece of negative information reached us. There were no gross Deutschland units in Danzig. Perhaps they had moved on to Gottenhafen. Gottenhafen was several miles to the north, on the bay, only a short walk if my foot would support me. With the aid of Hales and my broomstick crutch, I managed to cross part of the town. On the way, Providence intervened to help us. Some civilians who had been watching us from their house came out to meet us and took us back indoors. The house was warm, and it seemed as if the gates of paradise had opened to receive us. There was already a crowd of people in the house, refugees from the east, including large numbers of silent children, who seemed to relish the wall bench on which they could rest. I thanked the heads of the family for their unimagined charity, and shared my gratitude with those who had come with me. It seemed as if I were already reconciled with God through those fine folk. Guttenhafen was full of troops and desperate civilians who wanted to cross the Baltic, which was still controlled by the German navy. The good civilians who had given us a corner of their home for the night also gave us some soup. I don't think anyone could be more tired than I was, or more grateful than I for the care we received. I slept on my broomstick crutch, which seemed as soft as a eiderdown. Through the rain of shells which cut them down, the fleeing civilians entrenched in the countryside moved back toward town. Large German battleships were firing from the sea at advanced Soviet positions. The ground trembled and shook, and any window panes still in place fell out. We were trying to impose some sort of order on the swarm of terrified civilians who wished to embark for Heller. Retreating troops were also arriving in the city, which indicated that we could no longer count on our barrage. The town was gripped once again by frantic panic, and the civilians making their way to the port completed the paralysis of the order which had been maintained until then only with the greatest of difficulty. Although we all had evacuation papers, 
we were rounded up once again and sent to Zopot to fill a gap in the line. We left Gottenhafen, where despair had assumed a pitch of delirious intensity. With dry mouths and rage in our hearts, we climbed into the civilian cars which were to take us to our new Golgotha. Through the windows, which we kept shut against the cold, we watched the sky, where flights of fighter bombers buzzed like enraged wasps. At Brussel, we left our cars to plunge directly into the rubble. The town rang to the sounds of an exploding universe. The Russians were attacking everything that moved with rockets and bombs, and their planes came over so low we could almost see the grins on the pilots' faces. When they had gone, we moved back to our rickety cars and started off again through the flying dust. The road was strewn with rubble, and several times we had to dig our way through. We also had to skirt the enormous shell holes into which we otherwise would have disappeared entirely. Our journey ended when we were dumped, with our panzerfausts, at the edge of a small village. We could hear the big guns some ten minutes to the south. We ran toward a leafless hedge with a sidecar pulled up beside it. We thought we might receive some instructions, but we arrived too late. Both occupants of the sidecar had been shot. The driver had collapsed over the handlebars, his back reduced to a bloody pulp. The other man appeared to be asleep, but he too was dead. The bursts sounded closer each time. We had never imagined that the Russians were so close. Where were the rest of our men? Then we caught sight of them. We climbed over a garden hedge and came out onto a smooth piece of ground which sloped up to the horizon, some two hundred yards beyond and above us. Continuous trails of smoke marked the discharge of big guns and the impacts of their shells, and the grey sky was lit by flashes of white light. We had to reach that high ground, whatever the cost, and we all had our passports for the West in our pockets. I knew very well what kind of curse lay behind the closed faces of each of my companions. As if the malevolence of the situation were drawing us on, we completed our progress with a series of carp-like leaps unknown to any system of physical training. Three German half-tracks, which had been resuscitated from some unit, were pointing their DCAs at some twenty motionless Soviet tanks waiting on the brown and white ground. Soldiers, crusted with mud, crouched in shallow, hastily dug holes, pointing various anti-tank weapons at the monsters, which kept their distance. We had barely taken our places when a new salvo came over, first the bursts and then a thick fog of smoke rolling toward us, level with the ground. We could hear cries and moans from our positions. The half-tracks, which were more sheltered, were also firing, and all further speech was blotted out. The Russian tanks, which still did not move, began to fire too. Some of them seemed to be paralysed, and the smoke leaking from their entrails mixed with the smoke produced by our side, which a generous wind was blowing toward the enemy. Then an inhuman order sent us forward. As the tanks were not rolling toward our panzerfausts, we had to go out to meet them. In a series of miraculous leaps, we moved forward for several yards, through bursts of machine-gun fire which felled several of my companions. Our fear reached grandiose proportions, and urine poured down our legs. Our fear was so great that we lost all thought of controlling ourselves. We drew still closer, tearing convulsively at our faces after each leap. The tanks were unaccompanied, and their myopia made their aim uncertain. One of them was burning, some sixty yards from a hole into which six of us had crowded. Then some of my comrades moved out. I stared after them with enormous eyes as they mocked their imminent deaths. Three tanks were moving toward us. If they rolled over the mound which protected us, the war would end for us in less than a minute. I can still see those tanks blotting out everything else. I can also see the metal plaque and the nose of my first Panzerfaust, and my hand, stiff with fear, on the firing button. As they rolled toward us, the earth against which my body was pressed transmitted their vibrations, while my nerves, tightened to the breaking point, seemed to shrill with an ear-splitting whistle. Once again I understood that one could wear out one's life in a few seconds. I could see the reflected yellow lights on the front of the tank, and then everything disappeared in the flash of light which I had released, and which burned my face. My brain seemed paralysed and made of the same substance as my helmet. To the side, other flashes of light battered at my eyes, which jerked open convulsively wide, 
although there was nothing to see. Everything was simultaneously luminous and blurred. Then a second tank in the middle distance was outlined by a glow of flame. It had not been able to take the three projectiles we had lobbed toward it with a considerable degree of precision. Our fingers clutched feverishly at the launching tube, which jutted against the sky somewhat to the left of the burning tank. We could hear the noise of a third tank crossing a hillock just beyond our position. It had accelerated and was no more than thirty yards from us when I grabbed my last Panzerfaust. One of my comrades had already fired, and I was temporarily blinded. I stiffened my powers of vision and regained my sight to see a multitude of rollers caked with mud churning past in a dull roar of sound some five or six yards from us. An inhuman cry of terror rose from our helpless throats. The tank withdrew into the noise of battle and finally disappeared in a volcanic eruption which lifted it from the ground in a thick cloud of smoke. Our wildly staring eyes tried to fix on something solid, but could find nothing except smoke and flame. As there were no more tanks, our madness thrust us from our refuge, toward the fire whose brilliance tortured our eyes. The noise of the tanks was growing fainter. The Russians were backing away from the stubbornness which the devil seemed to have instilled in us. We collapsed onto the icy ground, whose touch seemed gentle to our exhausted bodies. The first three attacking tanks had been destroyed. The others, from each of which we pulled a wounded man, had been stopped. The rest no longer wished to expose themselves to our desperate resistance. They would undoubtedly reappear in greater numbers with the support of planes or artillery, and our despairing frenzy would count for nothing. We were still fighting, and although the disproportion of our strength relative to the enemies left us with no hope, our struggle was not in vain because it allowed a host of civilians to escape. During a sleepless night, other German troops joined us. We re-established our positions and laid down a minefield, which a fresh delivery of supplies from Danzig made possible. The mines were a powerful support for our defence, but unfortunately they were effective only once, and the Russians would certainly give the ground a preliminary going over with a heavy bombardment. For three days the Russians had been launching intensive attacks toward the bay, attempting to cut off Danzig from Gottenhafen. Ferham had been seriously wounded, and once again we had been forced to give up some ground. This time we had the invaluable support of naval artillery. If the Russians had not been there with such vast quantities of men and materiel, they would probably have been obliged to withdraw. The remainder of our forces was concentrated on a small piece of territory. The Russians were using planes against us, and it was above all their air power which overwhelmed us in the end. As we stared toward the horizon, we could see that the slightest projection had been eliminated. The territory, in which even six months ago life must have had a certain regularity and sweetness, was now experiencing an apocalypse. It was no longer possible to move during the day. The sky was constantly filled with Russian planes, which, despite the heavy opposition of our anti-aircraft defences, always returned in constantly increasing numbers. Our defences, moreover, were continuously weakening as the evacuation of troops began. We were among the first to return to Gottenhafen, where certain sections of the city were already the scene of fierce combat. Within a few days, the appearance of the town had entirely changed. There were ruins everywhere, and a strong smell of gas and burning filled the air. The wide street which led down to the docks no longer had any definition. The wreckage of the buildings which had once lined it was crumbled right across the roadbed, obstructing all passage. Along with thousands of others, we were put to work clearing away the rubble so that trucks filled with civilians could get down to the harbour. Every five or ten minutes, planes came over and fired their machine guns into the crowd, which broke and scattered at every corner. However, fear had reached such a point that people no longer took cover. They looked down toward the boats, filled with the anguished hope that they could embark before the Russians entered the city. These people showed no human expression, their faces were contorted masks. Their eyes blinked mechanically, as if they had lost the power to see. Others, whose lives were already beyond hope, were wandering aimlessly among the piles of broken stone. They were still talking, and their aimless gestures sometimes made them look like those maniacs who live on the fringes of society, although there was no longer any society for them to inhabit.
The commandant, together with the harbour master, were in charge of this mass of people, which included soldiers from all the branches of the German army, as well as the sick and wounded, all of whom were hoping to be evacuated. Most of these people had papers, but the commandant was receiving orders to restrict the number of passengers for fear that the boats might be sunk. In fact, several torpedo boats, accompanied by some smaller ships, were already lying at the bottom of the bay. For us, the question of embarking had to be deferred until the following morning. After all we had suffered, the delay seemed unendurable. Once again, the sight of all those waiting people reminded us of cattle lined up for the slaughter. The sense of catastrophe affected the behaviour of the waiting men and women, who ran about aimlessly or stood rooted to one spot, staring at the vessels lying beside the docks. Our shattered bodies ached to be taken aboard one of these boats, which were preparing to leave for Hela. The SS Marine Police came running through the streets, herding the crowd toward the docks with a show of blows and brutality. Many of them were drunk and had to be held back by officers who struck them across the face with riding crops. Several people fell during the rush, and no one paused to help them up. Everything was chaotic. Some units were breaking up into smaller groups, which then dissolved entirely. The tanks, supported by large-caliber artillery, were firing without pause, and a German destroyer lying just offshore was adding its share to the clamour. Inside the town itself, the terrified civilians were adding to the panic which was on the verge of assuming monstrous proportions. A huge crowd of people waited at the edge of the dock. We also remained there, hoping to take a boat out of Gutenhafen to Hela. The crowd was already immense when we arrived. The faces of the wounded betrayed an agony which must have been worse than their physical pain. Each of them had tried to make himself as small as possible so as not to be noticed. Most of the people here had lost everything and wore the expression of a sleepwalker whose mind is elsewhere. They were prepared to pay the highest price just to gain a place in a boat. The commandant tried to evacuate the wounded first, but they were helpless in the melee and risked being thrown into the water at any moment. No panic, shouted the police. Our anti-aircraft defences will hold them off. By now we knew what that meant. All the shelters were filled with the wounded, and each of us had to find whatever protection he could. If the bombs fell near the harbour, there would be impressive carnage. We moved toward an old hulk pulled up on the shore, whose tarred timbers might be able to ward off a few blows. We hadn't quite reached it when the massive crackle of an anti-aircraft barrage burst all around us, fired by our coastal defences or by one of the warships we had glimpsed earlier. This was my first experience of such a barrage. The falling fragments alone were capable of no small damage. To the east, the sky was spattered with numberless black spots. The noise of firing was so loud that we couldn't hear the planes approaching. Finally, we saw three of them, flying quite low, parallel to the shore, pursued by the black granules of exploding flak. We heard an explosion to the south, over the water. One of the planes must have been hit. The police had not been exaggerating. Not one plane flew over Gila. We felt a wave of confidence and security. Finally, the Russians had been stopped. The police came and checked our cards. Be back here for embarkation on the underscore of March, a non-com told us. While you're waiting, you can make yourselves useful north of town. We took ourselves off without any questions. What is the date today? Hals asked. Wait a minute, Wallace said. There's a calendar in my diary. He looked through his pocket but couldn't find it. In any case, we're not ahead of ourselves. But we ought to know all the same. Howells persisted. I would like to know exactly how much longer we have to wait. We finally learned that it was Sunday, the 28th or 29th of March, and that we would have to wait for two days, as I remember, the last two days of the Ost Front, which had consumed so much of our lives. We spent those two days in the throng of anxious refugees camping out on the narrow Gila Peninsula. There were two more attempted Russian air raids, the last victim I was to see was a dirty white horse. A Russian plane had been hit and was disintegrating above us. We all watched as the forward part of the plane, whose racing engine gave off a long howl, plunged toward the ground. 
The noise terrified the animal, which slipped its collar and galloped, whinnying toward the spot where the roaring mass of metal would land. It must have taken about three steps before it was hit. Its flesh was scattered for over fifteen yards in all directions. On the evening of April 1st, during a spell of terrible weather, we boarded a large white ship, which must have once taken rich people on cruises. Despite the anxiety we all felt, despite the crowd and the stretchers, and the wounded with their rattling breath, my eyes gaped at all the magnificent and barely faded details inside that elegant ship. I was reminded of the shop windows my father had always taken me to admire at Christmas time, but I didn't have the courage to rejoice. I knew that such feelings always end badly. In the darkness, our boat pressed forward through the large hollow waves. A short while before, the sound and light that had filled the sky over the other shore of the Bay of Danzig had still reached us. Our comrades were still fighting and dying there. We scarcely dared think of the good fortune that had saved us, and that troubled us. For two days our boat slid across the sea, toward the unbelievable west, which we had dreamed of for so long, where we could not imagine the war. We learned that our ship was the Pretoria, and although we were allowed only a small space on the bridge, lashed by wind and rain, the sweetness of the moment made us forget food and drink. Of course a torpedo could send us to the bottom at any minute, but we didn't think of that. We also had a battleship escort. Everything was going very well. We arrived in Denmark, where we saw things we had almost forgotten, like pastry shops, which we devoured with enormous eyes, forgetting our filthy faces ravaged by misery. We scarcely noticed the looks of mistrust fixed on us by the shopkeepers, who couldn't understand us. We had no money, and the wares on display were not free. For a moment we even thought of our machine guns. Howells could not resist temptation. He held out his big hands, which looked like dead wood, and begged for charity. The shopkeeper tried to pretend that he hadn't noticed, but Howells persisted. Finally the baker put a stale cake into those filthy hands. Howells divided it into four pieces, and we tasted a substance which had become unknown to us. We thanked the man and tried to smile but the rotting teeth in our grey faces must have produced an effect of grotesque grimace, making the baker think we were mocking him. He turned on his heel and disappeared into the back of his shop. He couldn't know how long it had been since we'd had the chance to laugh, and that we would need a little while to learn how again. A less sumptuous boat took us on to Kiel, where we found a more familiar atmosphere, with no more bakeries and no more occasion to smile. In a setting of ruins, we were reincorporated, with alarmingly precipitate haste, into a scratch battalion. Hals asked if he might be given a leave to visit his home in Dortmund. An enlisted man of about fifty put a hand on his shoulder and told him that with a little courage and a little luck, if he managed to infiltrate the American and British lines, he might perhaps get there. My friend's face reflected astonishment, stupefaction and sadness. The American and British lines... In the West, which we had dreamed of and longed for so often, which we had finally reached, we were assaulted by the most overwhelming and terrible news. We were astounded. The West, the paradise we had been counting on in our icy holes at Memel, on the Dnieper, and on the Don, that chimerical paradise which should have taken us in and soothed our sufferings, the West, which had been our sole reason for surviving, was only a small country more or less thickly covered with buildings, a country where the silence was broken by the roar of planes, where terrified people crawled and ran. The West was also three dirty grey trucks carrying at high speed a reduced battalion of soldiers in grey toward another encounter with death. It was the place where my last illusions would crumble in conditions of inhuman grief. The West was the other half of the vice tightening on our misery. Several armies were challenging our exhausted arms, several, among them the French army. I cannot describe the emotions which this news produced in me. France, which in my thoughts had never abandoned me, la douce France, had abused my naivete. In the trenches of the steppe, I had loved France as much as any young man does as he talks revolution in the back room of a Paris café. Most of my efforts had been for France, which I had made my comrades in arms appreciate and love. What could have happened that had not been explained to us, 
France had turned against me when I was expecting her help. Perhaps I would have to fire at my French brothers, which I could no more do than I could fire at Hals or Lindbergh. What had happened? What had they kept from us? I no longer knew or understood. My brain refused to take in any more, and the hope which the West had revived in all of us died in me. We would have to fight again. Against whom and what? We knew that we no longer had any courage, and that nothing could lead us to hope any more. Despite Anglo-American cries of victory, there was no longer any opposition to the imposing materiel they had fabricated for nothing. No victory is possible over men who have died toward everything. We had reached the banks of the Elbe, and were lying stretched out on the grass beside a small road which led to Lauenburg. British troops were in the sector, and we were supposed to try to react. An older man was devouring the substance which fate still saw fit to deposit in our mess tins. Hals was a short way off, his eyes vacant as he pondered imponderables. The older fellow did not seem too depressed. He muttered some barely audible words to me. With a little luck, the war should be over for us in a few days. What did he mean? I knew that when a war ended for soldiers on the side that lost, it usually meant a small brownish hole in the head or the chest. I don't mean that, the other said. We'll be prisoners, you'll see. That's not so grand either, but it's better than bombing and starvation. You'll see. These fellows aren't moujiks. They're really not so bad. The night passed. It was mild, almost warm. We sat on the damp grass of the bank beside the road. Massive flights of planes growled invisibly through the starry sky. But nothing could interfere with our habit of half-sleep, which we had perfected during three years of enforced watchfulness. Toward three o'clock in the morning we heard the roar of artillery somewhere to the north, and the sky was lit by flashes of light. The whole episode lasted for about forty-five minutes, during which our half-sleep continued without interruption. Daybreak came early, and a light spring sun rose over the horizon. A small battered car appeared on the road, bumping over the broken surface. The car was brown, and was occupied by three fellows whose uniforms were quite different from ours. We watched as three brick-red faces beneath unusually large helmets drew closer to us. The owners of the faces appeared to be enjoying their morning outing. It was my first encounter with Englishmen, the first three. To have fired at these cheerful individuals would have been a criminal act. However, some bastard in our group did fire, twice, at their heads. The car, a jeep, skidded into a panicky half-turn, which was slow enough to give us ample time to wipe them out. The old man beside me roared with anger at the young fellow who had just done his duty, explaining that this ill-considered gesture risked bringing in motorised troops to attack us, against which we would have no defence. A startled Hauptmann almost intervened, but saw that there was no point and went back to stand beside his gunner. An hour later we heard the sound of several motors to the north of us. The old man's prediction was coming true. A reconnaissance plane flew over, directing the fire with considerable precision to the road beneath our bank. Clinging to the ground like treads, we crawled up the hollow of a small valley, thus escaping some fifty mortar shells, which would have inflicted heavy losses. The English must have decided that further resistance would be limited to a few isolated shots, and sent four half-tracks after us. We watched with a certain anguish as they climbed over the bank. Two of our men stood up with their hands raised. The Eastern Front had never seen anything like that. We wondered what would happen next. Would English machine guns cut them down? Would our leader shoot them himself for giving up like that? But nothing happened. The old man, who was still beside me, took me by the arm and whispered, Come on, let's go. We stood up together. Others quickly followed us. Hals came over and stood by me without even thinking of raising his hands. We walked toward the victors with pounding hearts and dry mouths. This was the only time I was ever afraid of the Western Allies, and I had provoked the fear myself. We were roughly jostled together and shoved into place by English soldiers with vindictive faces. However, we had seen worse in our own army, particularly in training under Captain Fink. The roughness with which the English handled us seemed comparatively insignificant, and even marked by a certain kindness.
In this way I laid down the arms and insignia of my second country, and the war ended for me and for my comrades. To humiliate us, they made us stand in the sturdy trucks which brought the relief of their victory to our faltering ranks. The closed, flushed faces of the English continued to reflect their non-comprehension of the smiling remarks which emerged from our famished faces. Howells even received a slap in the face from an English non-com, without much idea of what had happened to him. He had simply been comparing our easy ride as prisoners to our forced marches in the East. Then we met the other allies, tall men with plump, rosy cheeks, who behaved like hooligans, but hooligans who had been nicely brought up. Their bearing was casual and seemed to be designed to give them the opportunity to roll their hips and shoulders. Their uniforms were made of soft cloth, like golfing clothes, and they moved their jaws continuously, like ruminating animals. They seemed neither happy nor unhappy, but indifferent to their victory, like men who are performing their duties in a state of partial consent without any real enthusiasm for them. From our filthy, mangy ranks, we watched them with curiosity. It seemed that we, in the ranks of the defeated, were happier than these children, for whom paradise itself had no value. They seemed rich in everything but joy, a reassuring spectacle which reconciled us with humanity. The Americans also humiliated us as much as they could, which seemed perfectly normal. They put us in a camp with only a few large tents, which could shelter barely a tenth of us. Even in prison, the Wehrmacht continued to organise itself. As at Kharkov, or on the Dnieper, at Memel, or at Pilau, or in the black depths of winter on the steppe, space in the tents was reserved for the sick and feeble. In the centre of the camp, the Americans ripped open several large cases filled with canned food. They spread the cans onto the ground with a few kicks and walked away, leaving the division and distribution up to us. Everyone received a share. The food was so delicious that we forgot about the driving rain, which had turned the ground into a sponge. The packets of powdered orangeade and lemonade seemed the height of luxury, and collecting rainwater in the folds of our jackets to mix with them a gay, even joyous distraction. From their shelters, the Americans watched us and talked about us. They probably despised us for flinging ourselves so readily into such elementary concerns, and thought us cowards for accepting the circumstances of captivity, the distribution of food in the rain, for instance. Wasn't our condition as prisoners enough in itself to make us walk in silence, with that unbearable air which men have when their pride has been damaged. We were not in the least like the German troops in the documentaries our charming captors had probably been shown before leaving their homeland. We provided them with no reasons for anger. We were not the arrogant, irascible Bosch, but simply underfed men standing in the rain, ready to eat unseasoned canned food, living dead with anxiety stamped on our faces, leaning against any support, half asleep on our feet, sick and wounded, who didn't ask for treatment, but seemed content simply to sleep for long hours, undisturbed. It was clearly depressing for these crusading missionaries to find so much humility among the vanquished. In due course we were sent on to Mannheim, where we passed through a large processing centre. Hals, Gransk, Lindbergh and I had remained inseparable through all this, as in our worst moments. We understood only that the war had really ended for us, and had given no thought to the consequences of that fact. Everything was still too new, too much in the present. We knew that the worst was over, and that German ex-soldiers were organising themselves to facilitate the task of the Allies, who had to count their prisoners and assign them to various jobs. Our men, helping with this organisation, often in rags, moved through the elegant ranks of the victors, attacking with them the same pressing necessities. Cigarettes were given to the prisoners who had nothing to offer in return. Some even received chewing gum, which they chewed, laughing, and then swallowed by mistake. Orders were shouted in German, and ranks of men formed and broke up. Were they going to send us back to the line? That wouldn't be possible. A bastard non-com, carried away by the spirit of things, absent-mindedly shouted at a group of prisoners, Grab your weapons! He was answered by a howl of laughter. This made the Americans angry, and they came outside to shout at us. This struck us as even funnier, but it was clear that we had to correct our attitude, 
The erring non-com, who suddenly realised his mistake, snapped to attention, expecting a reprimand. Three American officers protested in their language, hounding the delinquent, who was himself overcome with embarrassment. A short while later, the prisoners were moving in long lines past a health inspection. Some were sent to a hospital, while others were shuffled through an endless series of offices from which a recruiting service would send them out to take part in the first efforts at cleaning up a country in ruins. Control and verification commissions then studied each case. These commissions often included representatives of several Allied armies, Canadians, English, French and Belgian. My scraps of paper fell to a French officer, who looked up at me twice. Then he looked up again, and spoke, at first, in German. Is this the date and place of your birth? Ja. Well? Yes, I answered in French this time. My father is French. My French was now almost as bad as my German had been at Chemnitz. The other looked at me with mistrust. After a moment, he spoke again in French. Are you French, then? I didn't know what to say. For three years the Germans had persuaded me that I was German. I think so, Herr Major. What do you mean? You think so? I felt embarrassed and made no reply. What the hell are you doing with this bunch? I still didn't know what to say. I don't know, Herr Major. Don't call me Herr Major. I'm not Herr Major. Call me Mon Capitaine and come with me. He stood up and I had to follow him. From the ranks of dirty grey-green, I sensed Hal's eyes fixed on me. I waved to him and called softly, Bleib higher, Hals. Ich komme wieder. Who's that you're talking to? The captain asked me, irritated. Das ist mein Kamerad, Herr Kapitan. Stop talking German, since you remember French. Come along this way. I followed him through a series of corridors, suddenly afraid that I wouldn't be able to find Hals again. Finally, we arrived at an office where four French soldiers were talking and laughing with a young woman, who spoke to them in English, I think. The captain said he had brought along a doubtful case. They put me through an extended interrogation, to which my answers must have sounded far from convincing. My head was spinning, and everything I said seemed to ring false. One of them, also an officer, called me a bastard and a traitor. As I remained apathetic and absent, they gave up on me sending me off to a small room on the floor below. For a day and a night they left me there, thinking of my companions in wretchedness, and especially of Hals, who must have been wondering about me. I felt a sinister premonition that I wouldn't see him again, and a feverish restlessness kept me from sleeping. The next morning a lieutenant, who seemed in a very friendly mood, came to release me. I was taken back to the office of the day before and asked to sit down. This invitation was so unexpected that the words fell on my ears as if for the first time in my life. Then the young lieutenant looked through my papers and spoke to me. Your story took us somewhat by surprise yesterday. Now we know that the Germans often forced young men with German fathers into their army. If that had been your case, we would have been obliged to keep you a prisoner for a while. However, with you it was the mother, and we cannot detain you. For your sake I am glad he added gently. We have now liberated you, and this has been recorded on the papers I am handing back to you. You may return to your home and resume your old life. To my home? He might just as well have been talking about the planet Mars. Yes, home. He paused for a moment, giving me an opportunity to speak, which I didn't take. I couldn't quite grasp what had happened or find the proper words. Nevertheless, I would advise you to clear yourself by signing up for a term with the French army and in that way return to normal life in good order. My expression remained impenetrable. My thoughts above all were with Hals, and I only took in about half of what the amiable officer was saying. Do you agree? Oui, mon lieutenant, I said, only partly aware of my own words. I congratulate you on your decision. Sign here. I signed my name, more interested by the French words than by their significance. You will be called up, he said, closing my folder. Go home quickly and try to forget this adventure. I still didn't know what to say. Even the lieutenant seemed to be losing his patience. He stood up anyway and walked me to the door. Do your parents know where you are? 
I don't think so, Mon Lieutenant. Didn't you write to them? I did, Mon Lieutenant. Well then, you must have had answers from them too. Don't the Boches have a post office? Yes, Mon Lieutenant. They wrote to me too, but we haven't had any mail for almost a year now. He looked at me in surprise. The bastards, he said. They wouldn't even send you your mail. Go along now, get yourself home, and try to forget all this as fast as you can. Try to forget. In the train, rolling through the sunny French countryside, my head knocked against the wooden back of the seat. Other people, who seemed to belong to a different world, were laughing. I couldn't laugh and couldn't forget. I had looked everywhere for Howells, but hadn't been able to find him. He filled my thoughts, and only my acquired ability to hide my feelings kept me from weeping. He was attached to me by all the terrible memories of the war, which still rang in my ears. He was my only friend in this hostile world, the man who had so often carried my load when my strength was failing. I would never be able to forget him, or the experiences we had shared, or our fellow soldiers whose lives would always be linked to mine. The train rolled on, carrying me minute by minute farther away from all that. If it had gone on like that for days and carried me to the other side of the earth, it would still have made no difference. My memories would have remained at my side. Then there was a station. My worn boots, which had tramped across Russia, scraped against the cement platform, and my disillusioned eyes took in the details of a place I knew well. Nothing had changed. The place seemed to be sleeping, although the unexpectedness of my arrival might very well have awakened it. Everything looked as it had. Only I had changed, and I knew very well that I would not be able to fit myself in. I stood for a while, staring at all the details, which seemed to me so small, walking slowly and hesitantly. Then I noticed that two station employees were glaring at me, clearly wishing me gone so they could go about their own business. I was the last person left on the platform. Everyone else had hurried away. Let's get going, one of them said. I went over to him with my papers. You'll have to show those to the station master. This way. The station master looked rapidly through my sheaf of documents and, clearly unable to make them out, rubber-stamped the lot. Mannheim? he said. That's in Bochi, isn't it? No, sir, I said. It's in Germany. He caught my atrocious accent and looked at me doubtfully. For me, they're the same thing. I was still five miles from my house and from the end of my journey, and the place where it had all begun. It was a beautiful day, and I should have been impelled by joy to run the whole way toward the incredible fact that drew closer with each step. However, my throat was knotted with anguish, and I could scarcely breathe. I felt my reason faltering, assailed by the incomprehensible emotion of seeing, touching and tasting the reality which surrounded me, the station I had just inspected with a fresh eye, and my village, about to become visible in that damp green hollow, and the imminent prospect of meeting my parents, which was so overwhelming I couldn't begin to think about it. This reality suddenly seemed so huge that I felt afraid. The front of the house, edged by a vine and cut by a door, which I had left three years earlier, and in the shadowy doorway an old man and an old woman. With my mind's eye I composed features on those shadowy faces, corresponding to the features of my mother and father. Then, like forbidden pleasures suddenly exposed, the furtive image grew dim. I saw that my little brother was there too, and was amazed by how much he had grown. A cold sweat suddenly began to pour down my emaciated body. The despair that had settled over me in the East was suddenly violated by a reality I had almost forgotten, which was about to impose itself on me once more, as if nothing had happened. The transition was too great, too brutal. I needed some sort of sieve or filter. Hulls and all the others, the war and everything for which I had been obliged to live. All the names of all the men beside whom, my eyes huge with terror, I had watched death approach, and death itself, which could have overcome us at any moment, the names and faces of all the men without whom I would never have made these observations, all of these things were incompatible with what happened afterward. I could neither forget nor deny them, and my position became untenable. My head was spinning like a boat with a broken rudder, 
as I walked slowly toward the encounter which I had so longed for and which I suddenly feared. A plane flew over very low across the sunny countryside. Unable to stop myself, I plunged into the ditch on the other side of the road. The plane throbbed overhead for a moment and then vanished as suddenly as it had come. I pulled myself up by the trunk of an apple tree without understanding what had just happened. I felt stunned. My blurred eyes watched the grass, which had been crushed by my weight, slowly straightening up again. It looked like badly combed hair. It was still yellow from the winter frosts and, like myself, was struggling to revive. This grass was not so tall, but otherwise reminded me of the grass on the step. It seemed familiar, and I let myself fall down again. The brilliance of the day rose over the points of the blades, forcing me to shut my eyes. The touch of the ground, silent witness of my emotion, reassured me. I managed to calm down and fell asleep. Only death is final. The hopes that Mamel had been unable to destroy could not be destroyed by peace either. When I woke, I set out again to complete my journey. My sleep must have lasted for several hours. The sun was setting behind the hill, and I arrived at twilight, which was preferable to the glare of full day. I felt anxious enough about meeting my own family. I didn't want to meet anyone I used to know who might not have forgotten me. So I arrived at the end of the day I had longed for so much and started down the street as if I had just left it the day before. I tried to walk slowly, but each step seemed to resound like a parade step at Chemnitz. I passed two young men who paid no attention to me. As I turned the corner to the left, I saw my house. My heart was pounding so hard that my chest ached. Someone appeared at the corner, a small old woman whose shoulders were covered by a worn cloak. Even the cloak was familiar to me. My mother was carrying a small milk can. She was walking toward a neighbouring farm, which I knew well. She was also walking toward me. I thought I was going to fall. She was coming down the middle of the road, about two yards from the grassy verge along which I had been forcing my steps with the last of my strength. Although my eyes were blurred by almost inconceivable emotion, I recognised her face. My heart contracted so hard I thought I would faint. My mother walked past me. I leaned against a wall to keep my balance. A bitter taste filled my mouth, as if it had filled with blood. I knew that within a few minutes she would come back the same way. I felt like running, but at the same time couldn't move and stood paralysed, letting the minutes trickle by. After a few moments, as I had foreseen, she reappeared, going the other way, greyer and more shadowy in the deepening darkness. She came closer and closer. I was afraid to move, afraid of frightening her. And then it was unbearable. I summoned up my courage and spoke. Maman? She stopped. I took several steps toward her, and then I saw that she was about to faint. The milk can fell to the ground, and I caught her in my trembling arms. She gave a long, drawn-out groan, and I was afraid someone would come. Carrying my fainting mother, I hurried toward the doorway, in which a young man had just appeared. This young man was my brother. Suddenly alarmed, he called out, Papa, someone's bringing Maman home. She's sick. Hours went by. I remained motionless and mute, surrounded by my family, who gazed at me as if they had forgotten that the earth was round. Over the fireplace, I noticed a photograph of myself as a young man. Beside it stood a small vase that held a few faded flowers. Time passed, leaving behind a monumental silence. The tale was drawing to an end. It would take all of us, those who had waited and I, who had hoped, a long measure of time to accept the evidence of our senses. I also understood that my return could create complications for everyone and that they too had needed courage to give up the habit of hope. The neighbourhood must not learn too quickly of my return, and for the time being our happiness would have to be kept secret. For the next few days, while I collapsed into an anaesthetising exhaustion, I could use the room of a sister who had married during my absence. In due course I would enter the victorious French army, which would make room in its ranks for a particle from the ranks of the vanquished. It was to prove an unexpected transfer for my unease, the filter I had been hoping for.
Of course, I would be a damned Bosch to whom a great kindness was being done. I would even be able to enjoy experiences which the others found tiresome. The discipline I was used to made it easy for me to be first, and I had to watch myself so I didn't annoy the others. I would meet people who hated me and others with generous hearts, who accepted the totality of my experience and offered me a glass of beer to help me forget. My parents imposed an absolute silence. I would never be able to tell them the things which would have relieved me. I listened attentively to the tales of the heroes on the other side, heroes to whose ranks I would never be admitted. People who hated me would pursue me with vindictiveness, seeing in my past only cupidity and culpable error. Others might some day understand that men can love the same virtues on both sides of a conflict, and that pain is international. The French army, which I had entered for a three-year tour, finally kept me for only ten months. Despite my sense of well-being, I fell seriously ill and in the end was sent home. However, before that, I took part in a huge parade in Paris in 1946. There was also a long silence of remembrance for the dead, to which I added these names. Ernst Neubach, Lenzen, Wiener, Wesreidau, Prince, Solmer, Hoth, Olensheim, Spolovsky, Smellens, Dunde, Kellerman, Freivich, Balas, Fritsch, Wartenbeck, Seaman Lays. I refuse to add Paula to that list, and I shall never forget the names of Hals, Lindbergh, Ferham, or Vollers. Their memory lives within me. There is another man whom I must forget. He was called Guy Sager. <laughs>